journal anatomy. You can study it from the book of general anatomy. You can also study it from the Snell's clinical anatomy, the book of your gross anatomy. In the start is a chapter of general anatomy. And there's detail given there also. So it's your own uh, choice, whichever book you want to study. Um, we prefer the book of Lake Hussain, GA by Lake Hussain for MBBS. For BDS, Snell's anatomy is sufficient. Let's start with the, the topic. Bone is basically a living tissue. You might think it's hard, so it might not be, but it is a living tissue. It's capable of changing its structure as a result of stress to which it's subjected. And like other connective tissue, it is basically of formed of cells, fibers, and matrix, the basic composition of connective tissue. Um, any student can tell me the uh, basic types of tissues present in the human body. Any student? Connective tissue, uh, muscle tissue, epithelial tissue. Mm, very, good. Tissue. Tissue. very good. Now, as you can see, these are specific tissues. And whenever you look at an organ, you can see a blend of these tissues. Like in a muscle, there's, there's not only muscle cells. There's also connective tissue, which is uh, supporting the fibers and uh, giving them a proper shape. There is also uh, blood vessels. And there's also nervous tissue. You know, nerves, they bring the uh, basically stimulus for the muscles to contract. So nervous tissue is also present there. Other tissues are also present there. But the basic functional component is the muscle fibers. Right? So if you look at any organ, you should be able to understand that what is the function of that organ? What is the functional component? And what is the supportive component? The supportive component will be like an active tissue supporting it, blood vessels, nerve cells, nerve fibers coming to that organ to uh, take sensory information or to give any motor uh, information if it needs to be given. If you understand this basic concept, it will be easier for you to understand the histology of most of the organs and be easier for you to understand the basic concept of human body. So I hope you got that, what I'm trying to tell you is. And also, if you understand this, you will be able to understand embryology very well. Because in embryology, the basic structure being formed is the functional component. And the supportive component is basically coming from the meso, mesenchyme or meso. I think you haven't gotten there yet, anyhow. But if you understand this basic concept, you will be able to understand embryology as well. So back to bone. Bone is a living tissue, it's not dead tissue. It's not hard like um, wood. It's a living tissue. That means it changes itself. It is constantly changing itself. Now you can look at this. Uh, you can see all the bones. We count them as 206. And uh, basically, its functions are because it's hard, because of classification. So it uh, gives protective uh, function. It protects main organs like brain and blue column. Apart from that, it also serves as liver which make movement easy. And it also has bone marrow inside, which is forming the blood, right? So if you look at this picture, one other thing that you see is that the important organs like brain, heart, and the lungs, these are basically protected from the outside, like an exoskeleton. But the rest of the limbs, they have the bones on the inside. And there's soft tissues on the outside because these are basically appendices. These are only meant for movement. Any uh, human being can survive without the limbs. These are basically appendicular. This is the main portion which you need. These are only meant for movement to um, gain food and only for those matter. To live, you need a heart sound heart, you need lungs, and you need a functional brain. So these organs have a skeleton on the outside to protect them. This is where the lever comes in. These are like levers. They help in movement. Okay, and third is the bone marrow, of course. Where is the bone marrow? You can see it here, and when you study the different types of bone, 
Here you can better appreciate bone marrow also. The bone basically exists in two forms. The compact bone, which is also called cortical. Anybody can tell me what cortex means? Any student? What does Mom, the word the covering? signifies? Covering. Very Mom, good. Covering. Very good. Outer covering, right? So this is basically the cortical bone, which is in the cortex, the outside. And this is basically the spongy bone. Why is it called spongy? Because if you look at it, it looks like a sponge. And it is also called cancellous bone. So you should know the both the names. Compact is basically very compact bone. You don't see any spaces here. See, don't see any spaces in it. It's very compact. Okay, and compared to this, this is like a sponge. So this is the compact bone, this is the spongy bone. And the compact is present on the outside and it's called cortical bone also. And the spongy bone is present on the inside and it's also called the cancellous bone. What it does consist of is basically, you can this, the branching network of tobacco. It's not like just... Uh, holes in it. No, no. It's proper branching network of tobacco. Now, you can see this is something which you will also study in histology also, but we just I just want to give you an overview of it. The bone is not exactly com, uh, comprised of uh, just uh, minerals stacked together to form compact bone. It has a proper structure, a detailed structure. So if you look at the compact bone, you can see a basic structure which is called the osteon. This is an osteon. This is an osteon. You can see this circular structure. This is an osteon. Right? And osteons are stacked together to form the compact bone. To increase the compaction in between the osteons, there are lamellae. And also on the outside. These are called circumferential and this is called interstitial. Circumferential means they are uh, form, performing, uh, they are forming a circumference around the bone. So they are circumflexional and only these are interstitial only. You will study it more, it more detail in the histology. Right? I'm just uh, trying to give an overview of how the compact bone is formed. And uh, what I want is that you should understand osteon because in the spongy bone also, these tribacli are formed by same osteons. These are basically osteons. So they form a branching network here. And in between them, there are only spaces. So this is the bone. And in the spaces, there will be the bone marrow. This is how the spongy bone is formed. Right? This is a cancelled bone. You can look at this now. See, this is an osteon, which is forming tribacli. And in between them, there are spaces available. This is the spongy bone. In the compact bone, as I showed you, all the osteons are compacted together. And where spaces are left, interstitial lamellae are formed. So this is a very compact structure. This is the difference between the compact and the cancellous bone. The trabecule in the cancellous bone are basically arranged in a manner to resist the stresses and strains. If you put the load here, the trabecule will form like this. See, it will try to support the structure. So they will form a linear structure here. If the board, uh, if the load is being transmitted over this, look at this. These are stress lines which are formed. This is how the trabecule form. It's just like if you look at a table. When you see a table, you see that they have, it is it is like it is placed on four pillars which are supporting the weight. Okay. Saying goes that in the spongy bone, it is like trabecule are formed with the tension lines and they support the bone there and in between there are spaces weakened so that this bone is basically very lightweight. You don't have to carry down a lot of weight because there are spaces between them which are empty. If all of this was formed of compact bone, the bone would have been very heavy to carry and uh, the species will have will be very difficult to move around for the species, right? So this whole mechanism is meant to have a lightweight supportive tissue, which is also very strong and weight bearing. So we have cancellous bone, we have spongy bone, and the spongy bone, the bacteria reached according to the line of stress.
The next thing is, of course, that we mean the triaculi, they are spaces. Now, these are empty spaces. These empty spaces are occupied by the, in the mercury by the bone marrow. Bone marrow is basically what? Bone forming tissue. And mostly it is present in the long bones and the short bones. Now look at this. It is a fresh specimen and it is pretty clear to you what I'm trying to tell you. Now look at this. This is the cortical bone. It is all very thick, right? Below that, you see spongy bone. And in between the trabecule, what do you see? You see bone marrow. Now the bone marrow can be divided into two types. If it is reddish in color, this is a fresh specimen. So if it is reddish in color, it is red bone marrow. And if it is yellowish in color, then we call yellow bone marrow. Right? Now, I think it is pretty obvious that the red band bone marrow will consist of hematopoietic tissue. It is forming blood. That's why it is reddish in appearance. Whereas the yellow bone marrow, if you look at it, it looks like fat. So basically, it's fat. These are, this is fat stored in the bone, which is now yellow bone marrow. Actually, the baby is being formed embryologically. The blood is being formed in the liver. But as the bones form at birth and uh, after that, initially the blood is being formed in the bones, in this red bone marrow. But as the child grows, the bone marrow red is replaced slowly and gradually by the yellow bone marrow. And when it, uh, the child is about, adult, about an adult, what happens is that all the bone marrow in the distal part of the limb. Distal is that means away from the body. It is converted to yellow bone marrow and only the proximal parts are forming the uh, become of uh, middle age. At that time, only the axial skeleton, the vertebral body and the ribs, only those have red bone marrow. All of the body then has yellow bone marrow. So basically, when the child is going, there's a lot of need of blood. So all the bones are producing the bone marrow. Gradually from the distal ends of the limbs, this bone marrow is being replaced by yellow bone marrow, by fat. Look at this. At the seven years of age, yellow bone marrow begins to appear in the distal bones. It starts appearing in the distal bones. The more proximal you get, that means the more near to the axis of the body. Uske cream wali jage jo hain, wo marrow produce karti nahi. Jitna dur aap body se na, matlab jo finger nere se aapki, aapki jo unghiyaan hain, wo sabse dur hai na body ki. Unghiyaan se aake phir haath hai, haath se aake phir aapka bazu hai. Aista, 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 jitna dur ka part hai, wo pehle yellow bone marrow usme aata jayega. Aista, aista, aista karte red marrow replace hoota jayega. Eventually, jo se proximal portion hai, wo reh jayega, paaki sab jo hai, wo yellow bone marrow reh jayega. Thik hai? So, same with age, yellow bone marrow starts to appear in the distal bone of the limbs and the replacement of marrow is gradually moving proximally. In adults, red bone marrow is restricted to the bones of the skull and the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. And the girdle bones, head of the humerus and femur, right? So all the proximal parts near to the axis retain red bone marrow in adults. The rest of the body, it has only red bone marrow, uh, yellow bone marrow, okay? Next comes the periosteum. It is very important. You may, might get uh, two or three MCQs on periosteum because it's very important. Periosteum is basically a covering of the bone. All bone surfaces have periosteum except where they are articulating with another bone and forming a joint. The part of the bone, for example, this part of the bone, it is within a capsule, right? It is forming a joint. So this part of the bone will have, will lack periosteum. Otherwise, all of them, all of the parts, have periosteum, which is basically a thick layer of fibrous tissue, which is covering the bone on the outside. And if you look at it closely, it is consists it consists of two. Outside. Now the cellular portion on the inside is be beneficial because it has osteogenic cells, bone forming cells. So the cellular portion on the inside will have cells which will move inside the bone and form bone tissue. And the outside is fibrous. How is that beneficial? Because muscles are being attached and tendons are being attached to the bone. So when they are attached, their fibers merge with the fibrous part of the periosteum. So we have two layers, the fibrous layer and the cellular layer. Cellular layer will be on the inside, fibrous layer will be on the outside. 
the muscles and adenosine will, will attach to the fibrous layer and the cellular layer will obviously help in the bone formation right it is very very connected to the bone especially where muscles and the ligaments are attached the bundles of collagen fibers you know their name is a sharpies fiber they extend from the periosteum into the midline bone now this might come as an mcq so you might try to remember that sharpies fibers are the bundle of fibers which extend from the periosteum into the midline bone so that it is tightly adhered the third thing is that the periosteum has very rich nerve supply and is very sensitive as you might have noticed bones don't have much nerve supply you cannot have sensations in them you have very rich nerve supply in your hands you can feel even the texture of any object that you are holding as compared to that bones they don't have nerve supply so they don't perceive pain Air or temperature, they don't perceive those things. But the periosteum has a very rich nerve supply. So anywhere where the bone is exposed and you hit the bone, you feel the pain on the outside. That is because the periosteum is the place from where the nerve supply or the sensory innervation is going, and the periosteum is the point where you feel the pain. That's why you always feel the pain on the outer uh, surface of the bone. when you have fracture the basic pain sensation is being carried by the periosteum now the periosteum is the layer which is present on the outside it is very thick and it is continuous and it is uh, formed of two layers but when you look on the inside of the bone there is also a covering on the inside but it is not very thick it is a very thin layer of flat cells which just you see this this which just encircle the inside of the bone right this is in circle the inside of the bone and in between them are present is the red marrow red marrow or the yellow marrow whichever it is present in between so the endosteum is basically present here look at this it's lining the bone tissue it consists of osteoblasts that means bone forming cells osteoclasts the cells which absorb the bone and so they are involved in the active bone growth the bone has a tendency to resolve itself where it is not needed and to form new bone in the area where it is needed that's how the bone grows and that's how the bone repairs itself and modifies itself according to the need now we can classify the bones according to regions or their shape region means where they are present and shape means what is general shape now look at this any uh, student can tell me uh, the difference between the bones which are blue in color and the bones which are yellow in color and um, that is the axial skeleton very good you can look at this that is present along the axis and this is the axial skeleton and the yellow are the pendicular skeleton ठीक है जब इसको डिफाइन करना कैसे करते हैं एक्सिल स्केल्टन और पेंडुलर स्केल्टन एक्सिल स्केल्टन में क्या आ जाएगा स्कल की बोन्स हैं जिसमें क्रेनियम है फेस है ऑर्डिनरी ऑसिकल्स ऑफ कान के ऑसिकल्स हैं हाइड बोन वर्टिब्री स्टर्नम एंड रिब्स राइट देन इज अ पेंडुलर स्केल्टन पेंडुलर स्केल्टन कंसिस्ट ऑफ गर्डल्स फॉर एग्जांपल छोटी गर्डल हैज टू क्लेविकल्स एंड टू स्कैपुला देन द अदर बोन्स आर ह्यूमरस रेडियस एल्ना कार्पस मेटाकार्पस एंड फ्लैंजेस नाउ लुक एट दिस दिस इज द छोटी गर्डल scapula and clavicle is present there then there is the humerus radius ulna carpals and metacarpals same goes for the lower limb pelvic girdle two hip bones joined together then there the femur patella fibula tibia the tarsus metatarsus and the phalanges almost same pattern in both the limbs so this is how they look according to region but when you look at their shape they can be classified according to their shape as long bones the bones which are very long and present in the extremities the short bones they are also present mostly in the extremities but they are most like a more like a cuboid 
they have almost same width and length right then there are flat bones flat bones are like flat sheet of paper flat then there are irregular bones which have a very difficult shape to put in a specific category and then the last category the sesamoid bones now you should memorize the uh, categories and the examples because mcqs in mcqs mostly what happens at either we give a name of the bone and we say which category does it fall in and you have to mark which one is right either it's a long bone or a short bone or flat bone or it can happen that we can give that which one of the following example of short bone and there might be names written of different type of bones and there will be only one short bone given so you have to mark the correct one so you have to memorize the names of these categories and at least two examples each because uh, mostly we try to give uh, the examples which are given in a book because you are not going to study the limbs as such as uh, the mbbs students will do so with just examples given in book one of them might come in an mcq you have to memorize the categories now let the, let's study the categories in detail first of all the long bones these are basically the ones which are found in the limb they have a very great length as compared to their breadth right now it has a tubular structure this is called a diaphysis this is also important because uh, mcqs also come about this one of the parts of the long bone is given and you have to describe it or a part is described and then asked about okay, what is the name of this part right so you have to know the names the parts of the long bone basically it's like a tubular shaft diaphysis which is obviously the weight bearing part right and then there are the epiphyses epiphyses are called the expanded ends you know they are expanded ends of the bones and these expanded ends basically articulate or form joints with the next bone right so this epiphysis at the end and diaphysis is between see now the usefulness of this long bone is also that it keeps growing and growing until your adult that's how you attain your height because these long bones continue to grow and how do they grow because there is this structure present between the expanded ends and the diaphysis there is a cartilage which is called the epiphyseal cartilage this epiphyseal cartilage keeps growing and growing and growing because it keeps growing because on both ends the bone keeps lengthening and that's how height is attained it is also called growth plate because this is causing the growth in the long bone so growth plate or epiphyseal cartilage in adults when you have attained your final height this ossifies ossifies means that it finally forms bone and it stops growing after adult life you cannot have an increase in your linear length it's not possible even if you take any medicine for that to increase your length it will not increase your height it will increase your breadth it will just increase you will just increase the bone's mass length cannot be increased as the cartilage has ossified now it will not start forming more bone okay so in the growing phase the epiphysis is separated from the epiphysis by the epiphyseal cartilage this is the part of uh, the, the bone which increases the length the part where the bone is growing and new bone is forming this part just below the epiphyseal cartilage is called the metaphysis metaphysis is the part where the new bone is being formed this is the metaphysis right so again diaphysis now what the diaphysis has so you can look at it it has an outer part of compact bone and in between there is a marrow cavity the outer part is composed of compact bone and inside there is a hollow marrow cavity and this helps in minimizing the weight of the bone on the outside is covered by the Very awesome. So this is the diaphysis or the shaft of the bone. The next is the epiphysis. In the epiphysis, you can see that it has in conscious bone with a very thin layer of compact bone. This is the articulated part, and that's why it is covered by hyaline cartilage. The rest is covered by periosteum. Now the short bones. Short bones, as I told you, they have the same. Length, breadth, and width. Now, uh, mostly of them, most of them are present in the hands and the foot. So, bones of the hand and foot, especially this region, the palm region. You can see these are called these are called the carpals. They are like cubes, scaphoid, lunate, talus, and calcaneum. 
right look at this the free cobalt in shaped cancerous bone on the inside and compact bone on the outside just the same as the long bones covered by periosteum except on the articular surfaces which is covered by the cartilage you have to uh, memorize a few names in this because and they might come in mcqs the next is uh, category is the flat bones i told you that flat bones are like sheets so since you have studied skull i would like to ask any student about an example of flat bones apart from the one written here any student zygomatic zygomatic is a flat bone no Ma'am, squamous part of the occipital <clears throat> bone. Parietal, ma'am. Parietal no, bone. Parietal bone. Temporal bone. Temporal, temporal bone. Temporal bone. Not all the temporal bone. This is squamous part of it. Right. Same with the right. right. bone. Right. Squamous part right. is basically right. named according to the shape. This flat and it's broad, right? Thank you very much. So the flat bones. You can easily see because you have studied skull. It's easy for you to understand that they are just like flat sheets. And if you look on the inside, they have two layers of compact bone on both sides and between. There's a spongy bone. In skull, it's called diploid. It's a name given to, especially to the cancerous part of the skull bones. So we have compact bones on outside and spongy bone on inside. For example, we have is the scapula. This is present on the back, and this is the arrangement of the flat bone. You can see compact bone, compact bone, and spongy bone on the inside. Next, we come to the regular bone. Now, any student can tell me uh, which bone is this bone. You can see the picture. Sphenoid. 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 Very good. This is the sphenoid. You can see it is body. It's greater wing, lesser wing. It's terrible plates. You can really be sure easily. Now you can. Just look at it, and you can understand why it's called an irregular bone because it's irregular. You're not put it in a category, right? So same goes for the vertebra. Vertebra is also irregular, and then the pelvic bones they're also irregular. See, irregular bone. You cannot put it, describe it in any shapes. They're composed of thin shell of compact bone, and they are made of cancerous bone. Same as the rest of them. Okay. Sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones are basically uh, bones which are formed where a tendon rubs against any surface. I hope you understand what I'm saying. When a tendon of a muscle is rubbing against a surface, it will cause friction, and if you move, you will damage the bone also. And because of friction, um, as I perceive that we have studied physics recently, and you should understand friction. Because of friction, it will create uh, damage and uh, heat and a lot of things. So. to minimize this and to increase the mobility and make the mobility more smooth what happens that where a tendon is being rubbed against a bony surface or a joint a sesamoid bone is formed inside the tendon so when a bone is formed this bone will move easily on the bony surface just like your joints do you feel your joints when you move your hands just clench your hands and feel just move your hands move your fingers and feel that you don't feel the joints that is because two bones are covered by articular uh, cartilage and they move easily on each other they just slip on each other so you can easily you can easily move them right same goes here that uh, to uh, reduce the tendon friction what happens that another bone is formed inside the tendon and this then moves over the bony surface and it is covered by cartilage so it easily moves now what happens is in human body some tendons are very large and they have this uh, problem uh, of friction so in human permanent bones are formed in those tendons when a child is born it is it is born with those sesamoid bones right the largest one and the best example is patella you can see here and you can feel it if you put your hand on your knee you can feel a small uh, bone covering your knee joint the knee joint is behind this bone right so when the tendon of quadriceps femoris moves on this joint it will cause friction because of that patella is formed and the under surface of the patella is covered by cartilage and that's why it smoothly moves over the knee joint when you're walking you don't feel this patella is now a permanent sesamoid bone that is present but this mechanism is present in other tendons also which are rubbing against joints or bones so sesamoid bones are basically small bones form in tendons where they rub against a surface 
and gradually as you grow many sesamoid bones are formed in small uh, tendons also but this one is a permanent and the largest which is called the patella which is present in the knee joint in this is a best example and most probably if in mcq comes patella will be written there see sesamoid is buried in the tendon piece of is covered with cartilage the function is to reduce friction on the tendon and it also can alter the direction of the pull of the tendon so this is again an overview of the bones long bones flat bones irregular bones and short bones these are the permanent bones and permanent categories one or two books just mention these four categories but majority of the bones books also mention sesamoid bone right long bones very long short bones like cubes then flat bones and then irregular which cannot be put in any any category majority of the as this is book of uh, picture of your uh, of your snail also that majority of the books put them in five categories including the patella which is a sesamoid bone thank you any question Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, sir. Love this man.